Yeah, we were thinking we at least have those three. Oh. Rise from the ashes. I'm Eric Baker, and I've lived in Tennessee my entire life. However, for the last decade touring the world, I've only seen it passing by from a windshield. But finally, Tennessee is calling me back where I belong. There's a place you've never been That's right where you want to be I want to rediscover how great my home state is, and I want you to come with me. Unshot. Now, I know I normally talk awful flowery here on Tennessee Uncharted, and I hope that you'll excuse the pun, but simply put, there's an awful lot of buzz about the bee decline these days. That's pollinator claps to the smarty pants out there, but we'll get to that. You see, I've never been a huge fan of bees. I can remember smacking down the carpenter variety from the wooden eaves of the porch with my grandfather during childhood summers. I can also remember being stung in the backyard while running through the sprinkler. It just always seemed that whatever they might be doing, bugs that buzzed were ultimately up to no good. So when I first started hearing stories on the news about the collapse among these critters, I thought to myself, well, good riddance. But as it often turns out, I was wrong, very wrong. And all it took was a trip to the aquarium to learn why. So if you're sitting at home and you're wondering what a monarch butterfly looks like, there's one right over my shoulder. I've taken a lot of trips through the winding walkways of the Tennessee Aquarium, and each time I find another variety of fin or flipper I knew nothing about. But of all the crazy creatures I expected to find here, butterflies were not among them. Most of our butterflies come from Costa Rica. There are farmers in Costa Rica that raise butterflies like some people raise a food crop. So instead of planting a plant that we would eat, they plant a plant that a caterpillar would like to eat. And they usually get a couple of butterflies to lay eggs. And once they, those eggs hatch, they'll take the tiny little caterpillar, it's called the first instar, and they put those on the plant and they net that plant. And that keeps the caterpillars from crawling away or birds from eating those caterpillars. And as soon as that plant is eaten, they'll take and move them to another plant. How many butterflies are we talking? I mean, because a butterfly's lifespan is... Very short. It's very short. A few weeks okay. to a few months, depending on the species of butterfly. And we get anywhere from 500 to 700 butterflies in every week. I know about the bees mm -hmm. collapse. And, mm -hmm. you know, is it the same thing happening with the butterflies? Or There is some some decline in the monarch population. They need host plants, so if the host plants decline, then you get a butterfly population decline. Uh, they also need nectar plants. Could be weather, so there's a lot of things that can cause a butterfly population to decline. And Christine Bach, our horticulturist, she um, is working with a, a butterfly farm here. So there, she's raising some native butterflies, and you'll you'll see probably you'll probably go out there and see those. She has a lot of caterpillars. Very neat place. You know, you talked about getting a delivery of butterflies. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a way to maybe see a sure. little more? Sure, we'll have to go in the receiving room for that because we have to unpack everything in our receiving room. Okay, I'll follow you then. All right. So now, this is uh, behind the scenes, right? Yes. Today's shipment day, is that? Yes. Is and that what you call it? That is what we call it. The FedEx um, guy just comes and says, hey, I've got, is that yes. literally how it? Literally, FedEx delivers them. <laughs> wow, that is so cool. Okay, all right, so, and this is the box. This is the box they come in, and you'll be several of these in a shipment, several of these boxes, and they come kind of packed in their own little uh, chamber there, so it keeps them nice and safe, and they don't get injured while they're traveling. So this part's the, end, the um, wings. You can kind of see some wing venation. This is where their eyes are gonna be, and their legs and the proboscis and antenna are all kind of folded down in this area right here. This is the abdomen, and the abdomen is the part that can wiggle a little bit. Sometimes they'll wiggle their abdomen a little oh, bit. Oh, I see, yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa, look at that! <laughs> oh, man, I'm sorry. No, They're okay. all moving! <laughs> Whoa, this is crazy! Science! We got here at a good time. We're about to release some butterflies. So th these just hatched tonight? Yes. Last night? Yes, overnight these emerge from the chrysalis and we release them into the garden at least once a day. Uh, more than that if we have a lot of butterflies. Man, those are pretty. And they're humongous. 
They do all their growing in the caterpillar stage. So ah. once they emerge as adults, they're full grown. They don't grow anymore. Oh my goodness, that is amazing. So what kind of butterfly is this? What this is one's it? called an owl. And because of that big eye spot that you see right on the hind wing there, kind of looks like an owl eye. And that's how I got the name owl. One of the exceptional aspects of the Tennessee Aquarium is their commitment to conservation. By bringing butterflies and visitors together, they not only create an educational experience on ecosystems, but they also support those who are saving habitat around the world. And just a few miles down the road from this gorgeous garden, an even grander garden is getting underway. We're at the... Tennessee River Gardens. Mm, this was a butterfly garden 12 years ago, and so at that time they planted a lot of things here mm -hmm. to attract butterflies, and the butterflies keep coming back every year and laying their eggs here. We're getting pumped up about some butterflies here, y'all. This is another parsley plant. We had about six or so caterpillars eating away on it, and then one of them went up and made a little chrysalis, if you can find it, on this right there. Oh, I see and that's going to be a black swallowtail. This can be anybody's backyard. This can be anybody's backyard, yeah. And should be. And from yeah. These guys, even at this stage, have got camouflage and all kinds of weapons against mm -hmm. getting eaten. Because I guess they're in a pretty vulnerable state They are, so right most here. of them get eaten. So like the monarchs are eating that toxic milkweed so they taste terrible. So yeah. birds have realized those guys don't taste good. Yeah. Just don't eat them, they don't taste good. Well, I totally see why you volunteer out here. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. I love how fired up you are. <laughs> like, you know, when, I mean, when you were showing me around and everything, why, I mean, why are you so fired up? I why is know, this so important? I just think it's interesting. The caterpillars are interesting, the butterflies. I think showing people nature, like you could be at your garden and not even see that stuff going on. Yeah. And then, and then all of a sudden someone just says, look what's right there. And then you go, oh, it, you know, it was there all the time. And that's what happens to the kids. They get, they do the same thing. You want me to send you home with some plants? A little yeah. Senna, a little. Uh, hey, let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Let's do it for sure because I mean, my little one would absolutely love it for oh, sure. Oh, that would be. So yes. let's go find some. Okay, I got some in pots. I'll just send you a little pot home. Seriously? Yeah, I'm serious. That's yeah. what I do. After walking around the Tennessee River Gardens, I see just how much a few acres of healthy habitat can attract. And having caught glimpses of caterpillars and chrysalis and crazy critters galore. I know this won't be the last summer afternoon I'm attracted to this oasis either. Pollinating one thing at a time. In the last 20 years, an estimated 165 million acres of pollinator habitat have been eliminated from the U.S. Now that's roughly the size of Texas, which as we're all aware is known for being big resulting as much from urban sprawl as the prolific use of herbicides and genetically manufactured strains of certain crops. The loss of this prized pasture has brought on an 80% decline in particular pollinators. But thanks to the enterprising efforts of the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, the borders of the Bridgestone Firestone Wildlife Management Area contain over 10,000 acres set aside as a sanctuary for wildlife as well as wildflowers. And what's resulted is an active ecosystem blossoming with bees, bobwhite quail, and big game alike. So what did I just pollinate, actually? What do we get some more well, of Well, what you did there was spread some seed. Yeah. Yeah. The wind catches this common milkweed and uh, produces a nice blossom. And then this is the seed. And the wind can carry this really well. And little brown seed there. Yeah. So the wind carries it, and that's how it's spread. And we got Richard and Paul here, and I mean, y'all are here on a day in and day out basis. And I was thinking that you guys were busy planning all this stuff. What you see here is on a three year rotation to keep it at a certain level. If it gets too thick, your wildlife, your quail have a hard time getting through the through the undergrowth of it. So we, we burn it down to get new growth. The next year after we burn, it'll be a field full of flowers. Yeah. And everything. It's, it's neat to see. A lot of people think bugs are bad, but bugs aren't bad, right? I mean, well, they're important, 
there are beneficial insects and some not so beneficial and some harmful of course but out here the food chain is present and living in, in this place for sure well hey i mean i just want to walk around and enjoy this place you guys are lucky enough to have spent a lot of time this is my first time so i'm gonna cut the cameras and go for a walk how about it <laughs> Just last week, I was at the Tennessee Aquarium, and I found out that monarch butterflies are pollinators, which was kind of blew my mind a little bit. I didn't know that. And I've been hearing a lot of buzz about the decline of pollinators, while you guys here are doing a lot to help that decline. Well, what we got here is this, of course, this is called Bridgestone Firestone Centennial Wilderness Wildlife Management Area. Now we're somewhere around 21,000 acres here. It used to be a farm. Um, and over the years, we, we gradually um, came up. Of course, you still have people that, that remember the old the old farm here and, and, and drive down the road and they, they'll stop you and ask you, says, well, they've let that place over there grow up. Right, you know, right. But that's what we want. And basically, we're trying to go back to the wild. Yeah. Of course, there's many creatures that actually pollinate flowers. You know, it could be honeybees, which, you know, we get honey from and it could be uh, native bees. There's up in the thousands of native bees in the United States. And it could be uh, like a hummingbird or a, a bat. A bat is a pollinator too? Some bats, yeah. Okay. Uh, and particularly in other parts of the world, many, many items that you shop for in a grocery store are a result of pollination. So when we talk about the decline, mm -hmm. what, what's causing this pollinator decline? A lot of a loss of habitat, which means conversion to another use, expand out uh, suburban areas, you know, and we plant a real nice, attractive lawn. Mm -hmm. You mow it all the time. A lot of people rush out before frost and mow. Yeah. And when if they can just wait until after the flowers are gone, so it had far less impact on pollinators. What specifically is going on that they're mowing down? Well, they're mowing flowers that are still blooming, so you stop the whole process of pollination. Well, thank you guys. I'd love to like kind of get a, a closer look at some of the stuff that we've been talking about. Right. Lead the way, James, right? <laughs> huh? Show, show us around your farm here, if you will. This is the buffet. Yeah, for, it's, the, uh, uh, for the birds. Groceries on the ground. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Every insect out here, something wants to eat it. And it may be another insect or it may be a bird. Well, it's tough be being an insect. <laughs> it, it's tough, yeah. <laughs> right. They have to be quick and innovative. You know, I'm holding the beggar's lice here. I was saying I can be a, a pollinator or a harvester uh, myself just by walking yeah, through Yeah, it's got here. a little purple blossom. Yeah. And then it uh, produces a seed. And then this is what? Mountain mint. Yeah, mountain mint. Yeah. Now, what does that do? There will be... Everything from honeybees, bumblebees, butterflies. Butterflies. Many of them use this plant as, as long as in bloom. We want these plants here. So yeah. They're not weeds then. In right. That case, okay. It also, you know, I look at my flower beds and there's more weeds than flowers, so it makes me feel better that I'm contributing to the pollinator rise by not pulling my yeah. weeds. It's fascinating, and you've opened my eyes to so much that I had no idea about. So let's hang out tomorrow. I'd like to learn some more things. Right? Yeah, <laughs> right. As a butterfly flies by, man. How perfect. <laughs> because of projects like these, Tennessee is guaranteed to keep her wide open spaces for centuries to come. But it begs the question, what do communities that have already grown up do to stay green? To answer that, I'm headed to a city that's working to fill the streets with the hum of honeybees as much as it does honky tonk. Or should I say, to fill the skies. If you visited Nashville in the last few years, chances are that you notice new construction going up in every nook and cranny that's available. And while all that new construction provides housing for the people, there isn't much left behind for the pollinators. But as I look out over the lush lanes of green, grazing every inch around me, I can't help but wonder if I've been overlooking some opportunities. Well, this is Music City Center, the newest convention area in Nashville. And we're on a roof. And we're on a rooftop. We're, we're on a roof that probably covers about nine acres, the total roof. Okay. And the lower roof here where we're at is, uh, has a little over four acres of what we call a green roof. The primary use of a green roof is in the urban areas now is to absorb that rainfall so that they don't get that initial flooding downtown. 
When we put the soil and plant material on this roof, it will, for at least four stories below, it gives it an 18 to 25 percent energy savings because it's another layer of insulation. But most statistics are saying when we put a green roof on, like the white membrane you see out here, so it doubles the life of the roof because it blocks out all the UV. Here on Music City, they decided to put honeybees up here to add another part of the environment and going green. And, mm -hmm. and these bees, they don't just pollinate this roof, they'll travel three or four miles away. So all of downtown Nashville essentially can get pollinated through the bees right here. Well, let's, uh, let's go di do some digging. I, got my, I need to get some dirt under my fingernails. Something is blooming on this roof almost all summer. There's about six varieties here of different plants. We're dealing with a two and a half inch soil. Okay. So that in itself is probably the first obstacle. Second, we're on a rooftop where the wind is blowing almost all the time, hard direct sunlight. Uh, the winters are extreme, the summers are extreme. What we've worked up here when it be 120 degrees. So it can be very hot drinking lots of water. So the yeah. plants are dealing with that same thing. We really looked at this initially, Eric, for what we'd have from runoff water going back into the storm sewer. But we realized the benefits of kind of getting back, helping lower the cooling on the building mm -hmm. so that in turn it helped with the environment. And then one of the real benefits that we saw early on was we got our honeybees here. Right. And so it was a great way for them and all the new condos and apartments downtown, kind of give them a great home, a sanctuary, as we know how, the, how dangered they are to these days. Yeah. And so then we started producing our own honey. You know, and how, how great is it? Here we are on the top of a convention center in downtown Nashville producing honey. You've created an ecosystem up here. And that creation, the benefits are flooding into the surrounding right, yeah. ecosystem yeah. and environment. And thanks yeah. for letting us come up here and oh. check it out. And oh, our pleasure. I hear you did a little work I did. today. I, I got my hands dirty. We appreciate I got, that. I got, yeah. I go, I'm going home and show my wife I actually did some work today. Yeah. yeah. of these in a day. Yeah. Man, that is work. Come on, today's all about the bees, not so much the birds, but it's about the bees. And not getting stung. So far I've learned about everything from living roofs to mountain mint and yet managed to avoid handling so much as one honeybee. But all that's about to come to an end, an enormous end, because nestled down below Nashville, outside of a town called Franklin, is a farm fighting for bees. And from their perspective, if you feed the bees, you feed the world. I just want to point out that I first thing I asked Jay when we rolled up was, is today a good day for bees? And he goes, ah, I think they're going to be a little pissy today. So, um... It makes for good entertainment. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's going to be a great day. So despite the slow, steady panic that was rising in my stomach, I suited up and stepped in to help. The purpose is to get rid of um, all smells that he's coming with from his house, deodorants, um, perfumes, um, all the laundry detergent, all the toots I had on the way out here. Yep. Ate bananas, ate sushi yesterday. Yeah. Um, we're getting rid of it all. Okay. All right, let's do it. All right. We're going to put a queen in this queenless hive. This hive does not have a queen, so there's no leader in front. We're missing a leader in the back. So bees are just like you and I in that they don't like to be in a wet, moist house. They want it to be livable, comfortable, no drafts, all that sort of thing. So. Bees are very efficient with the moisture and the air quality and control and all that stuff, so they're feeding a little bit of sugar water. So this is again called a nucleus hive. A nucleus hive is like a baby hive. It's what we raise here to start new beekeepers. Our business is all about trying to prepare and empower people to get involved in beekeeping, pollination, and this is one part of it. What do we do? We gotta feed the bees, we gotta feed the world. You know, one out of three bites that we take is thanks to a honeybee. Um, they have a huge impact that people don't realize. Uh, Say that us. again. One, one out of, of every three bites you ever take is thanks to a bee pollinating a certain crop. 
you name it, they're pretty much involved. One of the ways to combat our lack of bees is to raise as many nucleus beehives as we possibly can and get them in new beekeepers' hands. This is the same skill and art that has been around for hundreds of years. Okay. Um, which is kind of what's so cool about beekeeping is that nothing's really changed that much. Hold the frame just like this. Okay. And when you want to look at the other side, you go like this. You rotate like that. Ah, okay. The whole idea being you don't want to do that because your queen or something important may fall off your frame. Ah, okay. So I'm going to give it back to you and okay. you can practice. And then in the center here are all your babies, all your eggs. And the wow. best way to look for eggs is to turn your body with the sun right over your shoulder and look right at the bottom oh. of it. Do you see anything? The white? It should be glistening, uh huh? Yeah. That's royal jelly. Have you ever heard of royal jelly? I have not. So royal jelly is also called like food of the gods um, in that it's the most, it's like a super protein, a super food. It's what is fed to baby queens to raise them into uh, virile and strong leaders. Oh, this little guy's yep. coming out so right now. So he's hatching out right now. Can you see that right there? I'll hold it still in here. So that egg was laid 19 to 20 days ago. When you look at a, a beehive, even in my yards that are uh, managed by me, they are the same as uh, beehives in nature in that the outside of the hive is where the honey is stored and the inside is where the brood or the babies are stored. Okay. The whole idea being if a bear or a predator comes along and takes a swipe at the hive, the hive would rather that bear get the honey than get their babies because they can always make more honey. That's a bee bringing in pollen and pollen is the protein that is fed to these babies. And then nectar uh, is the carbs. So nectar is the honey, is the carbs. Okay. So the two together is basically what they all survive on. So I need your help. Can you hold on to this? Absolutely. In the Williams Hotel, we got a bunch of queens here. Okay. And this is called banking your queens. All it is is these are all baby bees that don't have a leader. So all these queens are in little boxes. And so all they're doing right now is taking care of those queens. So we just have a bunch of attendants in here. So you just reach in here and you grab one of these boxes. And this will be good because you can see what a queen looks like up close. And so these bees have stingers on them, right? That they all have stingers, right yep. Now. Bees don't want to sting you because when they sting you, they die. So that would be the last thing they do. Uh, their stingers have barbs on them. And when they sting you, it pulls um, the stinger out of their body. And the stinger has a little venom sac on it and the venom will pump uh, venom into your, into your system for about 20 seconds or so. So if you're ever at home and you get stung, best thing to do is scrape that stinger off as, as quickly as possible. What you don't want to do is squeeze it and pull, because then you've just pushed all that venom from that ah, sack into the stinger okay, in your skin. Okay. What do you say we get into an adult one and have you taste honey right out of the hive, um, a local honey? Well, yes. just, on average, a hive in Tennessee produces about 60 pounds. We'll be between 60 and 80 pounds of honey. Stick your finger in there, and you'll need to open up your veil just a little bit. Just like literally do this. Oh, yes. And tell me what you think. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> tell me if that tastes different than the normal honey from Publix or from mm. Big Store. That's because it's real honey. Wow, that is so you try good. It? All right, so reach so in there. How do you get, you just blow them off? It's okay if they walk on your hand. Oh, uh, I need to try you can, and grab the... You can just grab on either side, it's right in there. Nice job. You just rescued a queen. My heart's probably beating at a zillion miles an hour right now. Did you get stung? I did not. How about not that? Not at all, man, not at all. You approve? She good and fat? Oh yeah. Is a good layer? Yep. All right, let's go find a hive to put her in. All right, so all we gotta do is try and find the queen. Um, we're gonna move her to a new location. Okay. So you just gotta pull a, box, uh, pull a frame out here. Okay. See how active she is? Yep. She's also like, uh, some people say like a bulldozer, like she'll just plow through, because this is her hive, she's in charge. So she doesn't get out of the way for anybody. Let's do it the other way, do it. Um, this oh, way. down. Yep, exactly, okay. like that. Push it right in like Okay. She can get out, put it right back in the hive, seal them all up, play some uh, good music for them, and we're gonna walk away and let them get to know each other. Um, so that's it, we're done. Cool. You just helped create another colony, thank you. Nice work. Absolutely, thank you, man, for what you're doing. This is unbelievable work that you're doing. Happy to do it. And here I thought this whole time we were just coming to a honey farm but there's a lot more going on here, man. Typical Tennessee, there's a lot it. more. I love it.
the one hold on my heart that bees have ever had is honey. I honestly have some every morning in my coffee, but I never realized how much bees truly have to offer. In fact, it's a pretty sweet deal, all that they do for us. And thanks to people like Jay, more and more folks are learning how to help them in return. I've always been a fan of the saying, it takes a village. And probably because whether it's crafting a career or fostering a family, it's nice to have all the help that you can get. But over the last few weeks, I found that I'm not alone. You see, it takes pollinators of all shapes and sizes to put food on the table of every home around the world. But it's also gonna take stewards of all shapes and sizes to save them. For some of us, salvation will mean sprinkling a few seed bombs from Williams Honey Farm and helping with habitat. While for others, taking a stand will mean supporting public land. And for others still, getting involved may mean getting a green roof or giving to those who do. The opportunities to get involved and give back are as limitless as the wildlife and wilderness we stand to save in the process. Ultimately, it will be quite an undertaking, but there's no need to buzz off or to break out in hives. No, just help, however you can, however you like, because honey, when it comes to feeding the world, we'll all play a role.